um, if you're not already a member to um, to become one. Um, but I will note that I'm uh, presenting tonight in a, in a personal capacity. The, the Institute itself does not have um, views as such. Um, and indeed, the research is based, as Gary was explaining, um, on my PhD research, um, which was completed last year before I joined the Institute um, at the London uh, School of Economics. Um, I'll start um, with a, um, uh, a cartoon, which um, you see I've, I've titled the talk tonight, um, The End of the Long Distance Relationship. And this, this cartoon from the early 1960s um, kind of encapsulates the, the abiding um, uh, memory and understanding and narrative, um, perhaps particularly as, um, as it was seen in New Zealand of, of Britons joining the European community. And we can see here, uh, on the right hand side, a uh, very smartly dressed um, woman portraying New Zealand is clearly very unhappy that um, the old man John Bull has gone off with um, the, the European economic uh, community. And if, if we sort of fast forward uh, 60 years um, to uh, an image from earlier this year um, uh, related to the signing of the free trade agreement between New Zealand and the United Kingdom, um, this is essentially the modern equivalent perhaps of that. And you can see um, Damien O'Connor, the New Zealand trade minister with um, the trade secretary at that time, uh, Liz Truss, who's uh, now the um, Foreign Secretary and indeed one of the people who um, speculated could take over from Boris Johnson if they if they managed to um, rumble him off. Um, and you you might be um, um, uh, uh, welcome to think that the, the kind of intervening sixty years have been characterised by a whole lot of rancour and discontinuity and disruption in the relationship between. Um, New Zealand uh, and the and the United Kingdom, um, but I um, essentially set out in my research to really question that that narrative, this idea that New Zealand was um, shocked, betrayed, and abandoned when Britain joined joined the European Community. And I kind of did this um, by researching from from three perspectives. So I think I'm, I'm the first one to do this in, in relation to this topic, looking at it not only from the New Zealand perspective, the experience, particularly the political political and diplomatic um, experience at the time. Um, but the European community, um, so I spent some exquisite months in the, um, in the archives in um, the Tuscan Hills, um, uh, probably the most beautiful archival setting in, in the world, um, uh, to, to kind of uh, capture and understand the European community's perspective, and also the, um, the official archives in the, uh, the United Kingdom. Um, I also tried to um, overlay that with a whole lot of reading and additional research, looking at the broader context. So what was happening in the Cold War, what was happening in relation to decolonization, um, what was happening in relation to uh, the economic turbulence um, uh, uh, that, that kind of swept the world, but particularly in the, in the 1970s, um, because these factors all, all played a, a significant part um, in, the, um, in the relationship that, that New Zealand had with the UK and, and the European community beyond uh, at this time. Um, now, the, the lead in to the signing of the UK New Zealand Free Trade Agreement sort of brought up some interesting moments, and one that really captured my attention, um, particularly given the, the topic of my research. Uh, this was about, um, uh, so this was in March 2021. This is the, the British High Commissioner saying um, New Zealand needs to put the, the great abandonment story, the idea that New Zealand was abandoned by Britain as it joined the European community to rest. Now this generated quite a, quite a kerfuffle, um, but Clark was essentially making the, the, um, the statement um, which has been made by some historians, particularly economic historians, that uh, New Zealand was diversifying its trade away from Britain anyway. This is the idea that um, in, the, in the middle of the, the 20th century, around half of New Zealand's trade went to, um, uh, to Britain, but by the time of British entry in the 1970s, that was down to around 25%. Uh, and so, the argument goes that the um, 
the negotiations um, that went on as um, uh, Britain joined the European community to try and find a solution to New Zealand was something of a, a storm in a teacup. Um, it can be argued, some economic historians have argued, that um, the real action was kind of happening elsewhere, that a lot of the focus was on, was on Europe uh, and, and British trade, but actually New Zealand's economic diversification was, was where the real action was. And I, I have some sympathy um, with this point. I, I, um, um, I agree with, um, with Laura Clark, but up to, a, up to a point, because I also think that um, it, it, uh, the, the, the ongoing arrangements that were made for New Zealand mattered deeply, I think, within both New Zealand politics uh, and British politics, and also um, vicariously in, in European politics. Um, and so even though the economic need may have de been diminishing, although I'd argue that it's still, um, still quite important, particularly as the economic um, uh, uh, shocks of the 1970s roll on, and Britain through that period was still New Zealand's largest export um, market. But I would argue that politically it was seen as really important to get a good deal for, um, for New Zealand um, uh, as, uh, as Britain was, was joining the European community to maintain that, that trade um, uh, with New Zealand. And the, the, the idea that New Zealand was kind of shot betrayed and abandoned um, is actually a reasonably common one, not only amongst the broader public, but a number of historians have, have kind of made this point as well, including some eminent ones, uh, uh, including James Balich, Philippa Main Smith, et cetera. And, you know, they make this argument that, that New uh, Britain's kind of turning away from New Zealand essentially shot New Zealand into a, um, uh, a sense of independence. Uh, there was a final realization that the um, uh, the ghost was uh, uh, the game was up in terms of being a colony of Britain, and it kind of precipitated a whole lot of change. So um, there is a sort of dominant narrative, um, a sort of independence narrative um, that that has emerged both um, in the historiography and in the work written by by scholars, and also um, amongst the, the broader public. And I'll explain a little bit why why I think that has occurred. Um, and then from the British point of view, um, if New Zealand sees it as sort of Independence Day uh, from, from the British end, it's seen as um, a mark of imperial decline. So um, uh, the, the moment when Britain joined the European community, Britain finally realized that it could no longer be this uh, imperial power. And with, with this kind of thinking came the idea that Britain couldn't have both. Um, this came to kind of dominate the, the narrative that, that Britain, um, as part of the European community, could no longer retain its um, its close relations with its Commonwealth, with its with its former with its former colonies. Um, and as I'll go on to explain, I have a number of issues with with this interpretation. Um, but, but it's not the only interpretation because it's actually quite a, a significant body of work written by former diplomats, um, officials, and ministers, including, um, I've noticed a couple of people on the on the Zoom call, um, Ted Woodfield and Jerry Thompson, who were intimately involved, and I, um, I acknowledge them, and it always makes me slightly nervous to be presenting um, uh, research to people who are actually in the room um, during the negotiations and making some of these decisions. But um, th there's a body of work which um, has mainly been written by these former um, officials and by uh, Jack Marshall, the minister who, who negotiated a number of these agreements during the 1960s, um, that it was a diplomatic triumph for New Zealand, that, that the deals struck um, for New Zealand when Britain joined the European community kept um, New Zealand agriculture afloat long enough, that kept the dairy industry in particular afloat long enough um, to find new markets elsewhere, um, and that, that um, they were able to um, uh, uh, diversify um, in, in that sense. And you can see here that the two dominant interpretations uh, are in conflict. I mean, how can it be both a shock and betrayal and a diplomatic triumph that um, that was a um, you know a great a great deal for New Zealand? So I kind of wanted to use my research to try and explain that because sometimes you know I've seen um, articles in the news media which try and suggest both these ideas 
at the same time. And it's, it's, um, it seems to me slightly in in incongruous. And as I go on to explain, um, uh, uh, the diplomatic triumph, um, uh, I have perhaps more sympathy with that idea, but I also go on to explain that um, the triumph was more to do with the political conditions in Britain and the European community than necessarily um, New Zealand's expert diplomacy as, as good as it was. So if we go back and actually look at what the um, uh, historical record says, and once you start to do this, you can actually see quite a bit of continuity in how both the New Zealand and the British government approached this issue um, right from the very first steps of European integration. So um, 1950, it was um, proposed that Britain joined the European coal and steel community. New Zealand singled it out, singled itself out at that point by um, uh, basically encouraging, telling Britain that it thought it was a good idea because it could, it could have more influence from within the, um, within the, the organization than from staying distant throughout. So um, it, it kind of runs against this, this narrative that New Zealand is perpetually um, sort of uh, anti-European in integration. Um, and then uh, moving forward to the first application. So there was three applications Britain made to join the European community. The, the third one succeeded, as I'll go on to, to explain shortly, and they entered in 1973. But before that, there was a 61-3 um, application. Um, and as that was happening, um, uh, the British government sent ministers basically on a, on a tour around the Commonwealth. And you can see here the picture of um, Duncan Sands, the British Commonwealth Secretary, meeting with, with Keith Holdyoke. And um, they established uh, what became an important document from the New Zealand point of view called the Sands Communique, which essentially committed Britain to not joining the European community unless a, um, uh, a deal could be made, unless New Zealand's vital interests interest could be safeguarded. Uh, so... Um, Sort of um, this kind of created a uh, precedent which was to follow thereafter that New Zealand, New Zealand government, uh, at least privately, publicly, they were neutral on the idea of, of British um, joining the European community, but privately, actually, they were relatively supportive of the idea. Um, and you can see, you can see the continuity all the way from 1950 and indeed further back where New Zealand is seeking to use uh, Britain as its, its main ally in kind of world affairs as, as a voice to um, exercise um, advocacy for New Zealand interests from within, within these multilateral organizations. So, um, you know, you can see a, um, uh, essentially a pattern emerging. And the, the other pattern that emerged quite clearly in the 1960s is of New Zealand becoming a key test of uh, the merits of, of British entry. Um, and I'll explain a bit later as to why that is, but it gave New Zealand a disproportionate influence, I think, on the, the entry terms, particularly in, in the British um, the British policy. Another uh, point of continuity that, that, that um, was established at this time, but um, basically the political narrative uh, in New Zealand, but also elsewhere in, in, in the United Kingdom uh, and elsewhere became dominated by those who had, uh, who were essentially purveying the, the shock and betrayal narrative. So I'm thinking here of um, people like John Orman, the chairman of, um, the New Zealand Meat Producers Board, who attained a degree of, of public celebrity in New Zealand and, and Britain um, during the 1960s up until the early 1970s. And in those early, early years of the 1960s, he was vehemently opposed to, to British entry and thought it would constitute a betrayal. Likewise, Fintan Patrick Walsh, the, the um, chairman, chairman of the uh, Federation of Labour, um, he was, was also um, fr from the left anti um, anti-British entry. So because the New Zealand government was maintaining neutrality on this, this issue, it essentially left um, the way clear. And so it helps to explain why this kind of narrative of, of betrayal um, 
uh, uh, cemented itself in, in the public imagination. And even later on, when the deals were established to maintain New Zealand continuity of trade, they weren't able to shift those, um, those early perceptions. So um, 1961, there was a Conservative government in, uh, in Britain led by Harold Macmillan. 1967, there was um, another failed application by the Labour government under uh, Harold Wilson. Um, and yet again, New Zealand uh, kind of assumed a centrality uh, in, in the negotiations. If we fast forward um, to what actually happened when, um, when Britain joined the European community, um, as, as I was saying, the third attempt, um, New Zealand yet again assumed a, a, a kind of key key role in the negotiations, which uh, sometimes startles uh, audiences when I explain this in, in uh, Europe and in the UK, because I think um, to some extent it's forgotten. But um, Jack Marshall, the, the New Zealand Trade Minister and Deputy Prime Minister played something of a Brinks, Brinkman's role. And um, the, the, the British um, government was terrified that um, the legislation, accession legislation would be voted down by backbenchers on the basis of the New Zealand government's um, uh, reaction to, to the deal that was negotiated. And that, that um, gave Marshall the ammunition to essentially be a, be a brinkman right up until the final moment. New Zealand was, was the final, um, uh, final term to be decided as Britain joined during the, the European community. Um, and it, it's worth looking at what was actually contained in, in the, um, the Treaty of Accession itself, because, uh, you know, you quite often see it said that um, uh, New, New Zealand was uh, immediately disadvantaged by British entry into the European community. Um, but I would argue that it's actually a reasonably good deal. New Zealand was the only developed country um, to get a legally binding concession. It was, it was signed into the treaty that you can see the British Prime Minister signing signing there in the picture. Um, it it maintains uh, just over 70% of New Zealand dairy exports within the British market after seven um, after five years, uh, so the end of 1977. Uh, this was mostly butter because cheese was more problematic, particularly from, from the French point of view. Um, but the, the butter production um, uh, was more valuable to, to New Zealand exporters as it was seen at the time. It built in some reviews so that there was the potential for some continuity beyond 1977. And that um, it, it committed the European community to agree um, to help uh, essentially establish world agreements for dairy, although these were, were very slow to materialise, um, so that New Zealand could diversify in time away and find, find new markets and kind of prevent um, European community and other, other producers dumping their produce into, into third markets. And crucially at this time, lamb was unencumbered by um, European regulation. So there were um, three main exports to, to Britain at this time, which, which um, uh, accounted for um, around 70% of, of New Zealand's total exports um, to Britain. One was butter, one was cheese, and the third one was lamb. Lamb was not included in the, in the common agricultural policy. So uh, at this point was not subject to um, a whole lot of um, uh, regulatory um, uh, barriers to, to the market, although it was to come in uh, later in, in 1981. The, the deal wasn't um, uh, all good. Um, the, um, the dairy price basically failed to take uh, inflation and currency fluctuation into account, um, which as inflation um, took off through the 1970s, this, this was to become uh, a major problem, particularly as, as, the, as the British government essentially devalued the pound uh, on several occasions. Um, and from the British point of view, just, just to um, show you the measure of, of um, the political measure translating into uh, economic financial measure, um, at, the, at the last minute um, under French pressure, the, the, um, the British government agreed to up their um, uh, contribution to the, to the community budget uh, upon entry to 9% from 3%. So the fact that, um, uh, 
uh, I've had a look at some uh, UK Treasury analysis, which says that actually the real cost to the to the community budget was only 0.5% of keeping New Zealand dairy dairy in the in the market. So the fact that um, British government was willing to pay 12 times over the odds to um, to kind of keep New Zealand uh, trade going kind of shows the, the level of political um, importance that they um, they attributed to this. Fast forward again, uh, 1975. So a, a Labour government um, comes in in Britain, and um, it's it's kind of struggling. Um, the La the Labour Party is fractured on on the idea of Europe. So Harold Wilson decides to call the first referendum. Everyone's heard of the 2016 referendum, um, the Brexit vote. This was 1975, so the first one. Um, and yet again, New Zealand finds itself thrust. Um, uh, into the top of the agenda and the negotiations, the renegotiation between um, Britain and the European community. And um, it's, it's just by happenstance that 1975 coincides with when the New Zealand arrangement is being um, uh, reviewed anyway. So the British government essentially seizes on New Zealand as the one area where they can make a tangible um, uh, improvement to the terms um, brokered um, uh, as part, part of British membership. So um, because of this, yet again, New Zealand finds itself being um, uh, the last point or, or second to last point being negotiated at a summit, Dublin summit, 1975. Um, and yet again, New Zealand gets a reasonably good deal out of this. It gets um, a political commitment, essentially, to ongoing um, dairy trade in, in the European community beyond 1977, um, although the, the, the kind of regulatory basis um, uh, is still to be uh, concluded. Um, and you can see there the picture um, of a woman with um, shopping goods, um, emphasising that the main um, uh, uh, contentious issue during the referendum was food prices. Um, this will be familiar, you know, to to um, to, to people uh, today. But um, essentially, there was a, a food crisis sweeping the world, and tens of, of millions of people died in the in the early early to mid nineteen seventies. Um, and you can see here, this is a um, um, a pro common market um, uh, campaigner saying that the the price of food and um, within the community in London is, is cheaper than outside. And New Zealand kind of played into this debate. It yet again helped to keep New Zealand um, towards the forefront of, of, the, um, of the debate because it was seen as a cheap producer of good quality food. Um, and so it was helping um, Britain to deal with its uh, inflationary problems. Fast forward again, um, this is Margaret Thatcher um, and her, uh, as became known, handbag diplomacy. She would go to the European community and say, we want our money back. And uh, New Zealand yet again got caught up in this, um, in this debate. Um, and there, there's examples I found in the research where the British government was essentially um, uh, threatening to illegally import um, New Zealand butter in contravention of, of the treaty because um, to counter French uh, obstructionism of a, of a, a further deal. Um, uh, yet again, showing um, some time after British entry, the same continuity and the same um, political importance attributed to the, the New Zealand issue um, and, the, and the British government willing to, willing to act on that within the European community. Now, you may say that the, um, the Thatcher government and the Muldoon government in New Zealand in the late um, 70s, early 1980s were, um, were of a, a kind of reactionary variety and that they, they um, looked to the past and tried to unnecessarily keep the, the British trade link going. Um, so I've come up with a kind of final example here, um, the Rainbow Warrior bombing. Um, which obviously happened not, not far from here. And you might think, what's this got to do with European UK trade? Um, but very quickly, it, it, it morphed into a, um, a trade negotiation. So um, the New Zealand government uh, obviously apprehended uh, Dominic Pierre and Alain Mathar, the two uh, or two of the French agents who perpetuated the, um, the bombing of the Rainbow Warrior. And they, they were convicted in the New Zealand High Court and sentenced for, uh, to 10 years in prison. Um, 
But separate to that, the, the British government, sorry, the New Zealand government and the French government entered into negotiations to essentially release the prisoners. And one of the conditions that the New Zealand government insisted on was that France would not block its um, proposal to extend dairy exports to the common market, to the European community, um, uh, which was coming up for renewal in 1985. So you see here the Longy, the fourth Labour government, um, which is perceived to be relatively independent of, of, um, of action when it comes to um, foreign policy, still willing to prioritise that trade link with um, Britain and the European community um, over presumably something a bit more politically palatable to, to people um, in New Zealand uh, and, and which would have seen the, the, um, uh, the, the French agents continue to serve their uh, sentences in New Zealand. So the question remains as to why New Zealand was able to, to assume this important position within British politics. And I think there, there are several reasons. One, and the most important ones is sort of the fracturing of, of the main political parties along this European question, which continues uh, to this very day. And it, it, it is something which um, kind of uh, the fractures went horizontally, vertically and di diagonally and that you have people on both the left and right of both main parties um, essentially arguing on either way. And, and New Zealand was able to assume um, within this, um, this kind of uh, environment a, a, um, a, a something of a position as, as a test of the merits of, of entry. And uh, it, it, it was able to do this, at least in part, because so much of the, the political discourse at that point was heavily focused on abstract ideas of sovereignty and um, Britain's uh, global role. And New Zealand kind of emerged as a, um, a tangible example of where um, uh, uh, British terms could could make um, an actual difference, um, and it was also an issue that that was um, easily understood. So uh, a, a lot of debate around budget mechanism and and um, uh, coal tariffs and all sorts of other things, which which characterised uh, the British uh, relationship with with the European Community, were hard for the public to understand. New Zealand was a relatively easy um, concept to to understand, at least as it was uh, communicated at the time. Um, and I think the European community also uh, played its part. It's quite often characterised as a period of Eurosclerosis and the European community beset by um, crises and a lot of internal navel gazing. But also, I would argue, there were, there were uh, attempts to create a cohesive external foreign policy, particularly in the wake of kind of British and American retrenchment um, from their global roles. Uh, post Vietnam and post East of Suez, etc., the, the European community was trying to exert itself. And in this um, uh, uh, situation, it, it made it less likely for um, British uh, European policy makers to essentially jettison um, uh, the, um, uh, the, the needs of a small country. And also, I think, um, uh, just to give a nod to New Zealand's diplomacy, which I think by and large was. Um, uh, done well, uh, you know, with with meager resources, um, and, and indeed, it, it often um, a number of the former diplomats said that they kind of flew under the the radar and, and sort of did a lot of um, uh, diplomacy kind of behind the scenes. But I also think um, New Zealand was willing to dial up the the volume uh, externally um, as as required. So it kind of comes to um, my, my sort of main conclusions um, about the talk. I, I think we do need to question this idea, at least um, uh, in, in the kind of political and diplomatic spheres, that uh, um, Britain accession was a, a shock for New Zealand. And I wouldn't deny, and I'm sure Felicity will, will talk to this uh, in a moment, that there were tremendous amount of social and cultural change happening in New Zealand and in Britain at this time and a new kind of uh, national identity emerging in New Zealand, which was centred on the South Pacific and bicultural, et cetera. Um, but the interesting thing for me in that, and I, my research didn't necessarily focus on this, was that um, it, uh, um, similar kind of changes were happening uh, in Britain and in New Zealand, which, which suggests some of these trends are sort of transnational 
Um, and I think it further calls into question whether the changes in New Zealand were totally characterised by independence if they were also happening elsewhere, including in the, in the colonial uh, metropolis. Um, I think I'll, I'll finish it there and um, open the, the, um, the floor to Felicity to discuss uh, my main findings. Uh, nui Hamish, Kato, ko Felicity Barnes Tokoinoa. Um, good to see you all here live. I think this is the first time I've spoken to live people in something like two and a bit years. Um, but hello to all the familiar faces on Zoom. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, it's a great privilege today to be able to discuss uh, Hamish's thesis, which I had the pleasure of reading and examining along with Professor Stuart Ward. Um, a little bit late last year, late last year, is that about right? About six months ago or so. So it's good to revisit it now and to hear Hamish speak to his work um, again. And I guess my job today is discussing what I'd like to do is to talk from the point of view of both Hamish's argument itself, so kind of close grained, um, and also to highlight what I think are the wider implications of a thesis of this type. Now, my own work is in the cultural history space. So I'm a cultural historian. Uh, in, and my main, I guess, interest has been with uh, sort of the cultural engagement of the places that used to be called dominions. So Australia, New Zealand, Canada, not so much South Africa in my own work, but of course they are uh, word a dominion. And its impact on those places. So what did it mean to be part of this wider thing called the British Empire? And what were the cultural uh, connections. And of course, Hamish's work uh, comes at the tail end of what most people think of the imperial experience. So as we're coming into the 1970s, and I guess the conventional wisdom is by then, empire's kind of on its last legs, and something like Britain's turn to the EEC has a sense for us, at least in hindsight, of inevitability about it. So, um, so this story has particular resonances for me. So we'll start with a kind of a close grain focus, but then pull out to that, as, you know, expand the angle of vision, if you like, to think more widely about what the research of this type offers more generally and what we might learn from it when we have to look at other relevant and related issues. So let's start with the contribution, <laughs> which is always the nicest part. So Hamish, as he's shown here, has centered his thesis around a much mythologized moment in our past, that moment when, of course, Britain turns away from empire and towards Europe, or as Jamie Balich put it, when mother ran away to join a German commune. So this sort of idea of um, a, a major break, a discontinuity. Um, now, usually this moment has not been seen as our finest hour. Um, you know, with various politicians resorting, at least in public, to, to kind of cringe-worthy calls on our claims to Britain's attention, whether that had been through uh, sacrifices made in wartime or uh, through extended rationing, those kinds of um, contributions that New Zealand made, that we went the distance for Britain and Britain needed to go the distance for us. Um, and really what they were trying to you know, do is, is shield New Zealand from the loss of what was still a critically important market. Now, having recovered from our initial embarrassment around all of this, and with what's often portrayed as a kind of typically Kiwi number eight wire ingenuity or craftiness, we made the best of a bad job by securing some continued access. And then we, so the legend goes, went on to a much brighter future freed from our crippling and infantilizing dependence. Now, of course, it almost goes without saying that this moment has also played a role in another much mythologized moment uh, as a backdrop to and potentially causal factor in the 1980s reforms. So it has another sort of resonance over and above. So I think Hamish turning a critical eye to this sort of set of myths um, is, is well warranted. 
and um, he's done a very successful job of that. Now, the case. What case was he making? So through a careful reevaluation of archival sources, Hamish has undercut a lot of this myth making, and I think you've seen that in the slides and discussions so far tonight. Now he's drawn largely on official sources covering the period from the 1960s to the early 1980s, and by doing so has allowed a very different picture to emerge of the nation state one that's already going a profound international reorientation and that was able to harness EEC trade issues for the purpose of preserving and perpetuating many of the fundamentals of the link with Britain. So as a result, continuity is the fundamental motif here. And that, as you can see, is a significant change from what I would call, what I characterize as the conventional kind of narrative about this. So it, it repositions New Zealand as an exception to the orthodox periodization of British decolonization in the dec decades after World War II. So it's a different looking story. Now, this is also naturally where the thesis parts company with the shock and betrayal uh, part of the story. And as Hamish has, I think, recounted tonight, there, there has been a recognition for some time that New Zealand's export dependence on Britain had already de decreased by this time. Although interestingly, this is usually demonstrated, and Hamish, you can probably correct me if I'm wrong about this, as a share of exports rather than as a quantum of exports. And you know, interestingly, um, in the period uh, since World War II, from World War II, 1947 to, to 1959, New, uh, New Zealand's export trade with Britain actually increased in uh, dollar and pound terms, excuse me. So from 98 million pounds to 165 million in 1959. So what we see is a picture of New Zealand indeed diversifying, uh, but its uh, relationship with, with its, its uh, volumes of British trade were also remaining and, um, and in some cases growing. Now this would change in the 1960s, but of course, the 1960s is when start, some of this starts to unravel. So now, as others like Jim McAloon have argued, um, the pre-1973 trade conditions, despite this, were no kind of retrospective utopia. There was you know, a, a lot of sharp elbows in the trade business prior to 1973. And certainly, if we look even earlier than that, so one of the areas that um, I've been working in is the interwar period, uh, which had its own very fractious moment around the agreements at Ottawa in 1932. And I'll talk about those in a minute uh, as kind of a counter example of how these trade relationships can be very fraught and yet some connection remain. However, whilst um, Hamish has made us comfortable with continuity, I think he also needs to get comfortable with ambiguity. <laughs> And he'll be expecting this. I think all of these things can be true. So contrary to, to Hamish's position, all of these things can be true. And there might still ex exist the sense of betrayal. And to make my case for that, I want to suggest that sentiment can have a life of its own, disarticulated from the immediate, immediate realities of trade and politics. And I think given the decades of work spent building the sentiment around British New Zealand trade, because at no time was that a natural thing. Um, and I can explain a little of that. It would have been remarkable if there had not been a sense of betrayal, perhaps not amongst those in the higher echelons of politics, but certainly for the common person, for those on the ground or on the paddock, as it were. It might have been a myth, but it's one that has deep roots in our political, cultural, economic, and social histories. And so one of my particular interests is tracing the cultural resonances of trade materials, and certainly during the interwar period, and I suspect beyond, uh, but all forms of advertising of commodities uh, stopped in Britain during the war period. So 
from the 1920s for two decades up to the 1930s, New Zealand, Australia and Canada specialised in producing what they called British food for British homes. So New Zealand sent British New Zealand lamb to Britain, Canada and Australia sent apples that they marketed as British to the core. So this idea that um, that sentiment uh, might uh, be the, well, I think the cartoon said, you must realize some that there's no sentiment in business except when it suits us, was something that kind of cut both ways. Uh, the Dominions were very happy to market themselves as fine British producers of fine British food. They did this for a long period of time. And I suspect that those kinds of feelings that were built carefully contrived by trade organizations in uh, all three of those dominions had a legacy effect. That is not just simply that New Zealanders, as the rhetoric went, went to war and script and save on their food rations and so forth to feed Britain, but there'd also been a fairly concerted effort by producer boards across these three dominions at least to make that connection feel real. And so I'm inclined to think that we might both be right. <laughs> that there's the possibility of a different kind of cultural atmosphere around this um, that may uh, certainly not have um, concerned or have been so apparent for those who were involved in the machinations day to day. And even John Ormond, of course, eventually, as you know, it changes his mind. But it would be interesting to know, and to my knowledge, it hasn't been researched, what the public attitudes were. Now, if you look at the newspapers around the time of the, the announcement, particularly the abandonment thing, commentators like Bernard Hickey uh, wrote personal reminiscences of being a four-year-old on the family farm and how when this was announced, it was the cause of great consternation around the family dinner table. So it would be interesting to learn more about those kinds of feelings and add them to this mix because one thing we know about this, and we know this from Hamish's work, um, the, change, the change that occurred in 1973 was not simple nor straightforward. So, all right. To stay within my time, <laughs> I'll draw back. Um, some of the other benefits, I think, of this uh, thesis. Um, certainly, he's made a very original intervention here around the fundamental dynamics of the UK and New Zealand EEC triangulation to argue that it lasts after 1973 as well. So um, if we go by the very rough thumbnail that I used at the beginning of my talk, once 1973 happens, that's the big moment. But I think this uh, thesis argues very well to pay attention to what happens afterwards, the continuities that occur afterwards as well. And it's indeed ironic that New Zealand, a country widely regarded as the most abandoned, partially through our own rhetorical efforts, of Britain's Commonwealth partners, turns out to be the one with the more lasting role to play. So another very important, I think, contribution of the work that we're looking at here today. But let's zoom out for a minute and start thinking about the wider implications of theses like this. Sure, is that better? Now, Hamish's thesis is something that is relatively rare to come across my desk these days, which is a political history, a history that works with diplomatic relations and uh, those types of archives. And I might say that one of the key contributions of the thesis has to be, been to reassert the role of political history. Um, cultural historians like me are a dime a dozen, I think, now. <laughs> so it's great to see more work being done in the political space. And I, you know, but I do think we can see the value of greater dialogue between historical disciplines in the work that Hamish has done here. Now, economic history has taken a bit of a cultural turn in recent years, uh, with interest turning to the cultural construction of things like trust networks or the role of emotion amongst the so-called rational actors of, the, of economic orthodoxy. 
And I think Hamish has turned a political lens on a topic usually discussed in cultural terms. This is the shock betrayal idea. So it's good to see these other disciplines coming to interrogate these ideas. Um, and I think he would agree that in order to fully interrogate this particular historical moment, a blend of disciplines is what is required, even if one thesis um, is not the place to do that. Um, shock and betrayal, for example, are emotions. We might apply the tools and techniques of emotion history, the history of the emotions, uh, to such historical reactions. And indeed, this has been done in other fields. Um, Jane Lydon, for example, has recently showed in her study, Imperial Emotions, um, which tracks the role of empathy in imperial formations in Austra uh, throughout Australian history, that there's definitely room for uh, using such tools to help explain these um, particular types of historical problems and issues. And another example from, you know, the era that I'm more familiar with, uh, the Ottawa meetings of 1932, where there was a lot of shock and betrayal as well, although this time it was expressed by the British about the Dominions, um, who were considered very hard-nosed bargainers in the 1930s. Australians apparently were particularly mean-spirited in British eyes. Yet to read the discord at Ottawa as a prelude to the break of the empire would be misplaced. Australia's lead negotiator, former Prime Minister Stanley Bruce, may have played very hard for Australia, uh, but he also retired to the UK and happily accepted the title of Viscount Bruce of Melbourne. So perhaps not signature of independence uh, that it might have been. So the learning here is that it may well be more difficult than we think to disentangle the cultural from the political or to put it another way, we may get closer to the answer if we deploy a wide range of historical um, tools. Zooming out again and thinking of another issue, this idea of breaks and brutal snaps now. I mean, I think part of Hamish's argument has been to open this mic drop moment of the EEC to the influence of other significant events. And I think that's um, very important, the role of uh, inflation, oil crises, those other uh, global events that go around this time also help us uh, nuance and modulate the way we think about this shock and betrayal uh, mythology and narrative. And finally, although there's plenty more I could say about this thesis. Um, I think what Hamish's work does really nicely is address um, a kind of, what I see as a kind of a perennial issue between histories of the edge and histories of the center. So histories of places like New Zealand and histories of places like Britain. And what has, uh, he's done very well is to make what often seems like a parochial New Zealand story into something uh, quite a bit uh, larger and more significant. And I think there's something in that uh, for other uh, approaches to history as well. And again, here I draw on my own experience looking at something as simple as the business of advertising, which again is normally held to be something done from the center that drifts out to us here in the periphery. Whereas in the 1920s and 1930s, we were in fact uh, uh, pioneering global advertisers. So both at a fine grained level and in terms of uh, this work's relationship to broader fields, I think Hamish has accomplished a great deal. And it's been a great pleasure to be able to discuss just a portion of some of my thoughts around it with you tonight. Now, us looking at things of economics, 
bullet would be forward rather than backwards. And uh, my question for you is the electricity is on um, common and common 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 all those certainly on the common little countries um, have um, trade offices and other organizations and warehouses in Britain, for which they service in Europe. And uh, as far as I can make out, typically this is the fallout of where trade with the EU is actually going to the United Kingdom and other. To the other points of Europe. Now, uh, currently, I think for a hard Brexit uh, rather than a trade uh, customs, which is one foot in a very narrow margin, that would have been very different stories. Just for the people on Zoom, this is a question about the uh, what to do with the uh, arrival of Brexit and the potential barriers that exist now for a range of countries. And I think Hamish is going to take this one. Thank you. Oops, sorry. Um, thank you, Felicity, and um, to Brian. Uh, good, good question. I, I um, should stress up front that I'm no expert on um, the current uh, uh, machinations. Um, I'm, a, I'm a historian, although I do kind of follow it um, through the news media and speak to people officially. But I think you're right to raise a valid question: Is is Brexit on balance beneficial to New Zealand? Um, and in some ways it can be i mean the the trade deal done with the uk um is a good one people people tell me but um but there are also downsides and that britain is a relatively um liberal trading nation a net importer of food and it's no longer um advocating for that around the table in in brussels and as you say there's quite a bit of dislocation uh, and supply chains between Britain and the European Union at the moment. So I think time will tell um, uh, as to you know whether it is beneficial or not. Uh, as to what can be done about it, uh, a free trade deal with the European Union concluding this year would be would be um, uh, obviously a positive step. Um, and indeed, you know, I was looking looking at discussion of that from from the 1960s. Um, all the way through to today, and and um, there is remarkable kind of continuity in in the arguments, and and um, uh, both in the community and and here as to as to whether that should happen and and why not. So um, yeah. I'll... Any other questions? Sure. Um... Auckland War, but it's very noticeable. 
being in New Zealand now, they're only under the touch of the heroes who couldn't find Britain by offering them the extra class naval ships in the country. The column went around to the Atlantic at that point, but none of the European countries came to the it was noticeable that uh, you know, my colleagues in the running up to buy New Zealand land, to buy New Zealand this. So, did you sort of take that into account in any way of those sort of particular events that occurred? It was very noticeable that New Zealand was living in the 1980s and the whole Falkland War and so on. Yeah, so the, the, the question for the Zoom people was. Um, what effect did the Falklands War have on the, the New Zealand-UK relationship? Um, it was no doubt, I've seen papers both in the UK and New Zealand um, that the, the support that New Zealand gave, the Maldon government gave in, in, um, with a ship patrolling in the Indian Oceans, uh, et cetera, was very much warmly appreciated in Britain. And it came at a time when um, the um, the lamb was being introduced into the common agricultural policy, and there were ongoing discussions about continuation of dairy trade, um, and so I think that probably helped to colour um, part of the Muldoon government's approach, and and it it may well have have worked to that effect. Um, I'm not sure there there was initial discussions within the European Community, but my supervisor actually Piers Ludlow wrote an article, recent article on this, showing that. Um, the European community partners were also relatively supportive of Britain during the, the Falklands crisis. So um, uh, there, there's a kind of an interesting debate about whether Britain was perpetually the awkward partner um, uh, within the European community and how, how much it worked with its European... Uh, so I think that's, uh, going back to Felicity's point, I think that's a, an ambiguous story uh, in itself. But, um, but yeah, I think, I think the Falklands crisis um, and indeed the Springbok tour, which I've, I've written about elsewhere where New Zealand's policy was very much aligned with Britain, um, played a part and intersected, I think, with the, with the trade negotiations. You mentioned the Falkland War, um, that the historian possibly are aware that there was a relationship between um, Britain and the UK joining the EC and us going into the Vietnam War. Um, the Holyoke government resisted for years uh, pressure from Washington to put troops into Vietnam, put, just put humanitarian workers, and then um, LBJ, the first uh, president ever to come to New Zealand, flew to Wellington, and suddenly we were putting troops into South Vietnam. And apparently, what was said was if you don't do this, you will have no access in your, with your exports to either the USA or Canada. Yeah. yeah. The, the, so the question, the question was, what um, what effect did the Vietnam War have on um, on, on New Zealand's trade position um, with with Britain and uh, particular um, pressure coming from from the US? I um, I haven't looked at the papers on the Vietnam War partly because my 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 main focus was on the nineteen seventies, uh, um, but I could uh, you know well imagine your your point to be you know right on right on what, what happened. And others, Ian McGibbon and others have, have um, written, written about this. Um, I, I did look at a number of papers um, uh, concerning the Kirk government and continued um, New Zealand military involvement in Southeast Asia and the Five Powers um, Agreement. And also, um, uh, which, which Britain was very much encouraging New Zealand to... Um, uh, to maintain a part of, to maintain their military presence in Southeast Asia. Um, uh, so I think that's that's valid, and, and the Kirk government continued to do that. Um, the the, the Gulf Whitlam government in Australia was prevaricating. So I think there's some really interesting uh, intersections between the Cold War and um, and New Zealand kind of trade policy with Britain. Um, I'll just just address a question too from Aaron Ripley. Um, 
on on the Zoom because he's um, asking about the fact that the support for Britain, uh, the support for New Zealand, primarily came from conservative circles in the UK. Um, and uh, he's, he's kind of asking about the emotional connection, um, uh, which which influenced that. I think um, that's that's a very valid point. Although, um, and I think uh, Felicity um, has you know raised a, a, a question, um, a very valid question about the role of of uh, sentiment and continued cultural ties, etc. And I think you know within Conservative Party circles that was important, but also important on the left um, uh, within the Labour Party. Harold Wilson tried to position himself as a greater supporter of New Zealand than the Conservatives, and it, it kind of turned it into a um, kind of flipped it on its head. Um, and likewise, the Edward Heath government, Edward Heath during this period was perhaps the least supportive Prime Minister, although he, he did see it in, um, uh, as an important, politically important to get a deal for New Zealand. And I'd also point out that the people on the right of the European, uh, uh, of um, Europe, uh, UK politics who um, didn't necessarily see the UK's ongoing involvement with the Commonwealth as a good thing. And Enoch Powell, Powell is um, an example of that, where he sort of saw the Commonwealth as a, a gigantic farce, I think was the, the phrase he used. And he thought Britain should focus on, on uh, national renewal as opposed to recreating a lost empire. So um, it wasn't a universal support on the, on the right. Um, there were those on the left who supported New Zealand um, and likewise some on the right didn't. One other question that you were talking about. Internal politics of New Zealand at the time of the wrong government and changing politically to make the right group warrior. What else the changes that were initiated by the government saw with the wrong government's economic package, which basically at the time but we closed all the, took down all the plantains regarding the subsidy of Bangladesh. Companies go through and just crash out water bills, rabbit bills, you name it, and something like that. And just a kind of common thing to come in and about eight billion of animal plantains. They did establish new horticultural resources. Yep. And I was walking at that time as well, so I did feel it and the fertilizer subsidies I can Yep. So so the question is what role I think the question is what role did Britain's entry into the European community play in the in the um, reforms of the fourth Labour government? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this uh, this is kind of beyond uh, the scope of my research, which largely finishes um, by by the um, kind of the early mid nineteen eighties. But I think it's a valid point because a number of people within that fourth Labour government have kind of blamed British entry for the um, the introduction of of some of those policies. Um, I am a little bit sceptical of the um, the direct causation between British entry and the need to um, restructure in that way. I mean, I think had um, Britain never never joined the European community, maybe, um, you know, the New Zealand government would have still had to, 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 um, to restructure in some way. So, um, I mean, the other, the other interesting aspect of all of those reforms is, of course, they're transnational in nature. I mean, the name Rogernomics was borrowed from Reaganomics, and um, you know, we're, we're, was being similar policies were obviously being pursued in the UK and elsewhere at that time. Um, whereas quite often they get positioned as a unique New Zealand story. But um, and so so that's kind of interesting to me too. And that the the Thatcher government in the UK 
were obviously unhappy about the Longyear government's anti-nuclear stance, but then they would look at some of the economic um, reforms going on within the country and say, well, actually, that, that makes sense. And that's what we're trying to do. And, and um, so, yeah, I think there's, there's interesting, interesting parallels. It, uh, yeah, sorry. So the, the question is um, very good question. Um, New Zealand went from being having one of the highest, perhaps the second highest GDP per capita in the 1950s to languishing in the 20s today. And so um, has New Zealand never not recovered from British ent entry into the European community? I, I would um, perhaps uh, throw back a counterfactual and say what would have happened had either European integration never happened, the European Union was never formed, or Britain never joined, would New Zealand still have, have had to diversify away from British markets? And I think that they would. Um, I think the, the main cause of New Zealand's um, economic travails were other factors through the second half of the second, uh, 20th century rather than um, British entry into the European community. I think there were other more important factors. I mean, Britain um, did see a decline in spending power. It, sort of, it declined as a, as a manufacturer. Um, you saw the rise of, of um, consumer and manufacturing markets in Asia. Um, there were obviously, you know, um, uh, a series of um, economic crises and high high inflation through the periods, um, which had a significant effect on New Zealand's economic performance, and and I think economic historians have argued much more effect than um, Britain's entry into the into the European Community. And there's an interesting placebo, um, which may the argument was made by David Hall, who who wrote uh, Economic History which was also examined by Felicity, um, where he looks at the wool industry, uh, which was never subject to European integration, um, but New Zealand essentially lost and never recovered its market in the, Europe, in, in the UK um, because of the rise of synthetics and the rise of um, Asia manufacturing of woolen products. Um, so if that happened to wool, it might, you know, it could have happened to the other products, irrespective of, of British entry into the European community. So I guess my, my main question is, is the European community, the European Union, the main cause of New Zealand's loss of living standards since the 1950s? And I would argue, no, there are probably other more important. <laughs> So it takes five years to just see now the changes that each year in Europe is getting out of the data down out of the data up there. So thank you for that. Um, so I'd like to pull up with the over just to tell them also the first of all, there's no one to do so. First of all, for introducing us to the next to the histories, because it's not just history, but it's commercial history, history of the Asian Center of Country University. I would add that uh, uh, 
He's on Zoom. stimulating talk Thank and you. I hope that uh, each of you will move towards the present and address some of the questions to how to do it. Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, really got a point. Um, yeah, I mean, I um, uh, it took me back to my first meeting with my examiner, uh, my supervisor, years, and um, um, I, I explained you know, I was keen to do a um, uh, you know, cultural history of Shakespeare. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's all stupid. Yes. Yes. It would have been too large, perhaps. But, um, but it's it's valid because I'm trying to get it published for a book. So. Um, well, I sent off to OUP, thinking they would say no immediately, and they said we really need a manuscript. Um, uh, so I need to do quite a bit of work to get it to that point. Um, yeah, they asked us for potential readers and things, so yeah. it wasn't a blank note. So, yeah, so it's not a good thing. Yeah, no, it's easy. It's easy. Um, I, I really, really appreciate um, I mean, tonight for the examination. I think it's a good thing. Yeah, all right. Thanks. No, it's a sort of question, and I think the reason I want to say that I think every self-education should be in the Yep. Um,